So Vojta Filipec is our next speaker. And when we talked uh, about things that uh, he likes to think about and uh, he spends a lot of time on, there were two words that came up. One was maps, the other one was kids. He has two children and uh, spends a lot of time geeking out on maps and he'll share some really nice things about how to, how to get your maps on the computer, how to use OpenStreetMap uh, to, to show the maps. So this is a very practical, hands-on introduction and I'm very, very excited to have him here. So let's give him a big, warm welcome. Hello, thank you. Well, can you hear me fine? Looks like I can hear myself a bit fine. <laughs> so welcome to my presentation. Uh, it's 30 minutes and I believe that's sufficient uh, time for uh, teaching you how to build your map or rather how to use an existing map, project your points onto that map, how to make it shareable, how to make it interactive. Yeah, it, it says set up an interactive map in browser in a few steps. Really, it's, you will see it's few lines of codes and um, before I start speaking about that, I show you what we are going to build. So it's HTML document, right? This map, which contains the markers. So that's your points. Uh, if you have many markers, I will teach you how to collapse them into these super markers, which are then, uh, which are then clickable so that you get to the lower level. And once you click through the lowest level, you either will have still a supermarker here at this area we have three three points of interest or i was actually working or i'm working with a library so here you got one library and you will learn how to how to write a pop-up function for that library so really the goal is that after these 25 30 minutes you come home you take these code snippets from here you project your own uh, points there and you can share it with ease so a bit about myself. Yeah, I like maps and I like my children, but <laughs> otherwise I'm nuclear physicist by training. I've been in the field in data science since my graduation and it's long before it started being called data science. If you ever wanted to contact me, use this LinkedIn messaging function. And if you wanted to download this notebook, right, these slides are a rendered Jupyter notebook, please go to my GitHub and you will find it there. It's all runnable. Good, so why do I think that this topic is interesting for people? Uh, if you're a data scientist and you get a new source of data, then the very first step you need to do is to visualize the data somehow. You are looking for, say, for outliers. You are looking, you are going to understand what this data is for, and only then you use it for your task. And if you have data with numeric variables, you know, you do histograms or other types of plots. If you have categorical variables, you have charts or frequency tables. But with uh, geospatial data, you typically get such a data set which has some objects on a rows, and then for each object you get latitude and longitude, so position in the, in the coordination system, and then some properties like object name. Uh, I'm working with libraries, right? So I made up the number of subscribers to those libraries, and then you could have email address and postal address and so on. And so what, what do you do with this, right? You have some numeric variables here, but would you plot them in a histogram, histogram of latitudes? I don't think that's a good approach. So what we're gonna do with this, we will project these locations, these objects to a map. Then we will use colors, sizes, and shapes of the markers to express properties of those locations. So. It could be that libraries with many users will have a marker of different color and libraries with smaller user base will have yet another color. And then you have things which you want to, some details you want to code in a text. So we will display those pop-up text uh, for, for details. Uh, very often I will refer to these points of interest as a POI and whenever you do any or whether, rather, when, whenever you read any tutorial on displaying geospatial data, you will encounter this abbreviation, POI, points of interest. 
So for us, it's libraries, but it could be addresses of your customers or branches of, uh, of a supermarket, destinations of your private trip. Well, whatever we learned here is applicable in all these situations. So how we're gonna do these maps? So I will first prepare my data. We will download all libraries in Slovakia, and the main goal here is to promote the OpenStreetMap as a reliable and rich, con uh, rich source of information. And then we will, uh, we will do two use cases. So the first one is, I have my libraries. How do I plot them to a map, one by one? We will try a matplotlib. That's, I think, um, first option for everyone. And then I will show you, do not complicate your code in matplotlib. Uh, go to folium, rather. And I will share a few hacks for folium, which I found useful. The second use case is, instead of plotting particular points, let us group those points to some areas, and let's plot these areas and again use color to code the property of that area and that is called Horoflat map. We will do it with volume again and I will extend it. I will introduce a library called H3 uh, which was developed by Uber. Yeah, so let's go there. So in the preparations, this is a really short section. I'm telling you that OpenStreetMap is a community project which aims to map the entire world. Uh, the coverage in Czechia and Slovakia is really good. And the good thing is that whatever you see on the map, and sorry, I should have said it's comparable to Google Maps, it's comparable to maps at Centrum or at uh, Mapi.sk, whatever you see on the map can be downloaded through API. So I will comment this a bit. I'm loading the connection to the API then I'm looking for an area with this ISO code and I'm saving it to a variable Slovakia. Then inside this area, I'm looking for all nodes, ways, and relations. These are semantic elements in the OpenStreetMap, nodes, ways, and relations, which are tagged as an amenity equals library. And for these objects I found in Slovakia, I'm exporting them out and I'm exporting their tags you will see shortly that library can have tag like email address or postal address. And uh, if there are some complicated objects, I want to export the central location. Right, I run this query towards this API and um, I had a talk about this uh, at a PyCon in Ostrava. So I'm referring you to appendix where you find the details about this process. And really the bottom line here is that use OpenStreetMap as, as a source of any geospatial information you might like. It's, it's really easy. And yeah, after some, after some operations, uh, I end up with this, right? So one row is one library. I have found 1,100 libraries in Slovakia. Each library has its ID. It's a type of not way order relation. This is the position, this is the name. These are all the tags I found in the OpenStreetMap and I derived a new numeric variables count of tags. We will use it later. Uh, another important thing is that if you download such a data, then you can combine the object ID and the node, uh, sorry, object type, to create a URL which leads you to that object in the OpenStreetMap. So, I take the second library, this is Obecna Knižnica Ivanka Pridunai, and I plug in this word not and this ID into URL, and look, if I go there, I will make it smaller now, it really takes me to the open street maps. It's not called Obecna Knižnica Ivanka Pridunai, and I found 10 tags, exactly as, as uh, I see here, right? So these 10 tags correspond, this count corresponds to these tags. One of them is this amenity library, street number, street, uh, name, and so on. Right, so this information not only contains coordinates, but also lets you create a link which takes you to that, to that particular library. Good, so with this data, how do we visualize them? So let's try matplotlib first. We have two numeric variables, so why not to do a scatter plot? That's fairly easy. I do scatter plot of latitudes and longitudes, 
and that's the result. And I think it's easy, but not really the fancy thing I showed you at the beginning, right? You don't see the background map, and you see many libraries in Bratislava, um, not so many libraries in Low Tatras, and there is one point here. I'm not sure whether it's error or not, and I don't have a simple way how to, how to verify what it is. So we could definitely do better in Matlodlib. We could use some background image, uh, map image for projecting points, but I don't really know how to make it interactive. So instead of complicating the code here, I'm suggesting let's use Folium. And Folium is the central piece of this presentation, the, the thing I want to teach you about. So we are going to create a map which looks like this. It's, it's zoomable and unzoomable. It's draggable. You see li libraries are these points here. Yeah. And this pop-up tells me uh, I can find 10 various tags in the OSM, and there is a link to the OSM object, the same as I showed you before. So what do we need to specify to make such a map? Right? The, the first difference against Matplotlib, you notice, is that I have a background map. Right? I'm no longer projecting onto a white plane. So the second thing I need to specify is the location of these markers, locations of points of interest. These are the latitudes and longitudes. And then to, to have these colors and to have these pop-ups, I need to define yeah, color and pop-up text for each marker. And these three steps is actually what I'm going to talk about now. And you will see it's less than 10 lines of code and you get such a map instantly. One thing I would like to mention here is that, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm projecting from a local file, it's HTML file, which contains all the information. So if any of you approaches me that you would like to have my presentation, I can share it with ease or I can publish it. The person who's consuming this even doesn't have to have uh, Python installed since this is HTML document. So the highlight here is it's easy to share these maps. Yup, so let's go for creating a map now. You import Folium and then you initiate your map like this. You call it Folium map. You say what is the central location of this map. I'm taking my data frame with libraries and I'm calculating the average of latitudes and longitudes, which is apparently close to Banska Bystrica, right? Then I say what's the zoom level, so this is zoom level eight, this would be nine, no, I think this is seven and this is nine. And I'm saying what service provides the background tiles. And I chose OpenStreetMap here, but this is independent of where I get the data from, right? Later I will show you there are other services you, you can get a map from. And I display that map and that's it, right? It's zoomable and draggable. So now it's time to, to um, get my data, my libraries in. Uh, we get them in using markers and look what I'm doing. So I have this data frame of libraries. I'm explicitly iterating through this data frame, one row, one library. And for each library, I'm adding it to, map, to my M map. And what I'm actually adding is this volume circle marker. So circle marker stands for this small circle. You need to specify where to locate it. And because I'm iterating row by row, I can use latitude and longitude on that road. And optionally, you can specify radius, fill, there are other properties. But the only mandatory thing is this location. And if I display it, I get the map, which is, again, draggable and, and zoomable, and I, I see those points here. Right, so this is how I project the markers. And in the next step, I want to make those markers colorful, and I want to uh, describe that, to, to have that description in a pop-up. So mind that explicit loop you can, with that explicit loop, which is evaluated on every row, right, you can have a function, I call it create color, which at each row looks at the count of tags, and if the count of tags is below five, I'm, I'm uh, returning this color code for, this is some yellowish shade, 
And if it's 12 and more, I'm returning this color code, this is dark red. And so far, it's just color code, it's, it's a string. But once I create this string and assign it to a property called color, it looks like this. So now I know that these dark red libraries have 12 and more tags, whereas this light yellow has le less than five or less than two, what was the first option. Right, so uh, I have my map, I have my markers colored. The last thing that remains are those pop-ups, right? So that's what, oh yeah, and a few hints. Uh, you can name the colors like this. I use this six, six, scale, uh, six value scale. Or this is a list of all values. So if you want to make a scale with 10 values, just pick any 10 out of these. What you saw is that the hexadecimal codes work too. Uh, and one page I want to draw your attention to is this, uh, is this uh, GitHub application where you specify the number of colors in the dark shades and number of colors in the light shades. And uh, it generates a color blind friendly scale for you it tells you the hexadecimal, co hexadecimal codes of those colors, so really this is very, very useful. So the last thing was those pop-ups, right? And similar to color, I'm defining a function which will be evaluated on every row. It's quite beneficial to iterate through those rows explicitly. And uh, this pop-up can be like constant string, but I'm going for something more ambitious here. I'm creating volume pop-up which is filled with iframe, and this iframe allows you to pass in an HTML text. So what's here, right? Uh, what I want to show in that HTML is a name of the library, which will get there from that row as it's a column called library name. Then comes a break HTML tag. Then will be hashtag of text, like count of text, and in bold, CNT, and CNT is count of tags, again, passed from that row of that data frame. And then comes um, link, which is called link to OSM details, and it's where it takes you is this URL, OpenStreetMap, or slash object type. We saw it previously, right, with the not slash object ID. And again, I get these two from, from the row. And additionally, I specify the width and height to, to specify the size of the pop-up. So this function will be evaluated on every row as with color, right? So pop-up is the property you assign that iframe with HTML there, and that's what adds these pop-ups to your map. So this is the first name, then comes the break, then comes the count of tags, 19, and yeah, it's dark red, it should be over 12. And then link to OSM detail. This, oh, sorry, <laughs> this should work. <laughs> Once again, oops, open a new tab. Right, Povarska Knižnica v Povarskej Bystrici. So that, that's the one I clicked on. Fine. So that's it. It's really not, not more complicated. To reiterate, I'm initiating my map. I'm telling what's the central location, what's the zoom level, what's the tile provider. Then I'm taking my data with points of interest. I'm iterating through them explicitly, saying location, where to project that point, uh, color, how to color it, pop up, what to display after this pop up. And one by one, I'm adding them to my map, and then I'm calling that map. So. I really believe now you can come go home. No, I mean in a few minutes you can go home, <laughs> take this snippet and just put some markers into your data onto that. I will be happy if you stay those few more minutes since I want to share a few hacks. So first thing, I was using OpenStreetMaps as a background source, background map, but you have a number of options. Um, this is Carto DB Positron. I'm, I'm drawing 100 uh, random libraries there. Uh, this is Stamen Toner, so a map which you can print and it will save your toner. And this is Stamen Terrain, where you nicely see 
right here, Popratska, Kotlina, and Tatras. And there is a number of others. Again, you, you can take this notebook and just uh, ch change these names here. So that's the first one, number of free background maps. Second, I am using circle marker, and in the morning I was at uh, the, the other presentation from my colleagues who, who, who were using the same, but there is some more, more general marker type, which is called simply marker, and look, uh, for a marker, you can use any icon you like. So the difference against circle marker is that <laughs> indeed you don't specify radius, but you can specify an icon and I was thinking for, for libraries, I, I would use a book, but the nice thing is that these icons, there are plenty of them at this page, font awesome. So again, I will unzoom, go to, back to this page. If you wanted to have an icon which is user circle or bathtub, you would just, in your code, sorry, you would uh, specify bathtub as an icon name. And again, you can specify color or pop-up. I won't do it now here. Uh, the other useful thing is to group those markers. Since at this map you see you have way too many markers and you can't really answer and, and question where do we have many libraries and where do we have just a few. So uh, there is a plugin in Folium. It's called Marker Cluster. And if you load your data uh, into, not into the map, but to this marker cluster layer. So, sorry, I should comment the code first. So I'm initiating the map as before. I'm adding a layer with marker cluster. That's this plugin thing. And then I'm, as before, iterating through my data frame with libraries. I'm adding circle markers, but no longer directly to my map, to this M object, but to the marker cluster. Then I display the map and it looks like this. So this library is far from all other libraries, so it appears separately. Uh, it's the same case, I think, for another one right here. This was the one which was very far from the other, so I was thinking maybe this is a mistake. Now I see it's not. But here you have 46 libraries, so you can zoom in and they disintegrate into 35, two, six and few libraries which are now separated out. And if I unzoom or zoom in these two, so I have this one and, and this one, whereas those, 30, those 36 disintegrated into some other supermarkers, one, one of them is these two libraries here. So this simple plugin allows you to do this grouping automatically, right? You, you see, I didn't need to specify the minimum or maximum number to, to group. And if I unzoom, it will restore. And if I unzoom a lot, I will eventually see three or if I zoomed out more, even one marker. Right, so that's the last hack. We learned how to, how to project the points on the map and the, the last chapter here, which will be very brief, and if you find it useful or meeting your requirements, meeting your needs, please go to this presentation to look into code of this, since these are Coroflat maps. I'm speaking about situation where I want to uh, group my libraries into some grid patches, and I'm no longer projecting single libraries. But instead of, uh, instead of that, I'm telling, so in this patch, in this area, you have many libraries, 13. Uh, in this one, you have just a few, and in this one, you have none. So how do we do that? This, this is called a horoflat map, or the Czech and Slovak word is cartogram. This color visualizes property of that, of that area, right, of aggregated points, no longer a single point. Uh, and yeah, use cases here, it can be number of libraries, but also population density there, or per capita income, or you name it. And the good thing is that Folium supports uh, Horoplad maps. There is a number of uh, use cases, or sorry, examples in their gallery, but the, the drawback there is you need to specify the boundaries of your areas. So if you want to plot anything in the United States of America, the boundaries of the states are well known. But in my case, that was not like this, right? I, I didn't want to define the boundaries of each hexagon. 
And that's where this extension comes from. It's, it's Ubers H3, and I see my time is up, so I will use two more minutes right for this. So Uber, you know Uber, that's ride-hailing company. They need to do a lot of geospatial analysis, and what they developed are, is this, they say, hierarchical geospatial index. So geospatial means that it's used as a coordinate system for their geographical analyses. They basically covered the planet Earth with this uh, grid of hexagons and sometimes pentagons. And yeah, that's it. Every place on the Earth has, is, is mapped to one of those objects. And then I said hierarchical. So you see that depending on what level of detail you want to, you can work on these large hexagons or smaller hexagons or even smaller. Uh, they refer to them as a resolution. So there, there is a link here where you can read more about their motivation for developing it. But what I want to highlight is these resolutions. So at the lowest resolution, they covered the Earth with 122 hexagons. And they are huge, right? The edge size of each of them is 1,100 kilometers. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have these enormous numbers of small hexagons, and the size is 51 centimeters. So what I used for that map I was showing earlier is resolution number five, I think. Yeah, and if you want to replicate my work here with your data, that's the first thing you need to do, decide what resolution you're working on. And I find this hexagon with length eight, eight and a half kilometer quite reasonable. Right, so how do we move from that list of 1100 libraries into these hexagons? So the first thing is that for each library, for each lat long, I need to find the hexagon ID, right? And the good news is that H3 library contains a function for that, geo to H3, tell me latitude, tell me longitude, tell me the resolution you're interested in, and I give you the hexagon ID. Second, I will group those libraries into hexagons, so that reduces the data set from 1,100 libraries to 200 something hexagons. And then you see that in the pop-up, I want to say how many libraries are in and what's the hexagon center, how do I find the hexagon center? Well, there's another function for that. Tell me hexagon ID, and I will tell you the central, central point. So having this data set, it actually looks like this. You have hexagon ID, count of libraries for the color of the hexagon and for the pop-up, and the central location, there are 204 hexagons. Having this data set, you work as before. Right? You would define a code for colors. I derive the color from the count of libraries. You define a code for a pop-up. Now I look at the latitude, longitude, and count of libraries again. And I do an explicit loop through my data frame with libraries. I'm, I wrapped the code for the actual visualization. I wrap it like this. I display a map. And that's it, right? I know that this yellowish are hexagons with less than five libraries, I think, and the red are more than 12. Sorry, more than 12 are here, right? And then I remember there is a hotspot. This hexagon contains 69 libraries. The map is still zoomable, clickable, easy to share. I use this car to db backend, right? And that's really it. I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Vojta. So we have a bunch of questions. Uh, the first one, what are the current best, best practices for geocoding? How do I turn a list of, uh, a list of addresses into geo coordinates? Right, so um, this presentation has a number of appendices. I was considering to edit there. Let me tell in short what geocoding is. It basically means Geocoding engine is a thing where you throw in an address, address which is typically provided by the user. So it can contain typos, mix of low and uppercase, and you get back the, the coordinates. Uh, my experience with this is limited to uh, mappy.cz. They have a free geocoding engine and to Google Maps. And both of them work reasonably fine in Czech Republic, in Slovakia. 
I have also experience from Poland uh, that was not that good, but still uh, the map it, maps at Google apparently worked, map it sees that not. It's API call where you send in those user provided input and you get, uh, you get latitudes and longitudes. I really recommend you these two services. There is also reverse geocoding where you throw in the latitude and longitude and you get the address. Uh, again, you can use the same, same two engines. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, is there a way to easily generate the tiles for OpenStreetMap on my own machine? I'd love to have a zoomable and clickable map running completely offline. I don't think so, actually. So OpenStreetMap, it's a really huge community project, which apart from downloading tiles like online, as I was doing here, allows you to run your own instance of OSM. So this API, which I was showing, is for downloading the points of interest. There's another API which allows you to download the entire tiles with all the descriptions. Uh, so you can download them once and then project from your local computer, or you can work out your own instance of this tile server. But please re refer to OSM or approach me if you want to find details. Basically, the idea is that you clone OpenStreetMaps and you serve those tiles yourself, but it's not fully online un unless you download them beforehand. So the keyword to search for would be the tile server, right? Yeah, it, it would be tile service at the openstreetmap.org page. Thank you. Can you create markers without iterating over the data frames records, for example, in a single call with the whole series? Well, uh, you can. So two aspects of this. Uh, I was using it for, for educational purposes. And indeed, in, with Pandas data frame, you can uh, use some smarter approaches like apply. But still, I think that apply under the hood goes one by one. And then I saw an example. It was actually an example of my colleague, right, Michal and Marcel, who were iterating not through a data frame, but through a list of indices. and. Well, I'm happy with that, uh, with, with this explicit iteration, since we had these 1,100 libraries and it takes like half a second to load them. So I don't really know, I didn't have a reason to parallelize this. So sorry, can't tell you more. I'm happy with explicit, <laughs> explicit iterations. Thank you. How do I filter out points of interest that are not in the current view during iteration? For example, I don't want to calculate the color if the point isn't visible. You don't want, oh, no, I think the idea is different. You first project everything on the map and only then you, dis or to put it this way, you come up with a map, then you project all the points on the map and even if you zoom in and out, there is nothing recalculated. It's, it's all there, actually. So it's not, it's not recalculated in the real time. No, it's rather you once place it there, and, and it resides there even if, if, I go, uh, if I go back. So I zoomed out. If I zoomed in, you see just a few hexagons, but still in this HTML document, all of them are still there. So you don't really hide them. What is the maximum number of points of interest that Folium is able to display? Uh, is it, uh, just disappear the question, is it uh, thousands, millions? What, what is the reasonable right. number? So the largest use case I worked with was plotting these hexagons over, over Indonesia, which could be thousands of hexagons. And then I was also developing some predictive model for all houses in the Czech cadastre. And now I don't remember whether it was 200,000 houses. I, I think so. So my experience is limited to these dozens or hundreds of thousands of points. Yeah. The next question is, aren't Google Maps free to use in such a project? And I'll extend the question a little bit. Um, why do you personally prefer OpenStreetMap to other solutions? Yeah, so I think that Folium doesn't support OpenStreetMaps. I think, sorry, <laughs> Google Maps, but I only think so. I'm not, not sure. Uh, with Google Maps, you register there, you get an API key, you have 1,000 calls per month or per day, maybe even, 
and if you exceed this, you pay a few dollars for additional 10,000. So it's it's sort of free, but I have, have never seen it at Folium. My preference for OSM is that it's community project, right? It's created by people like you and me. Uh, I was cycling here this morning and I was following a uh, routing engine from OpenStreetMaps and I found that the road was not correct since there was one one-way street which was not mapped as one-way street. So after my presentation I will go to OpenStreetMaps and there is there is actually a edit button here so I will edit the description of that road there. Yeah, it's interactive. You can create you can edit it yourself. I like to contribute and I also like to use it. I really encourage you to try hitting this edit button and <laughs> review whichever point you know that it's not accurate. And so if I may elaborate on that, there is also a community here in Slovakia called FreeMap. It's like a civic association. Uh, a bunch of people who really like OpenStreetMap and uh, if, if you would like to try this out, uh, it's possible to visit them in person. They do something like mapping parties. So, uh, you know, they combine the two things you mentioned, you love children and, uh, and, and mapping. So I took my own children to such a, such a mapping party. We went for a weekend with our phones collecting uh, GPS tracks and then they, they uh, showed the newbies, like myself, how to add those things to the map. We updated, you know, opening hours for, for when the stores are open, things like that. So um, there is this huge community aspect. I totally second that. So if, if you go to FreeMap SK, uh, that is one place to uh, to get started. Um, can you select the language of the map? Like you mean those descriptions? I don't really know. <laughs> I, I don't really know. My guess is that you can't, but maybe there is some other hack there. Uh, you remember I was showing you what what maps are available. It was here. And I'm not aware that you would be able to say open street map and for example, comma CZ or comma uh, ENG. So sorry, the answer is I don't really know. <laughs> uh, is there open street map uh, app for mobile devices? Uh, let me extend the question again. What is your recommended application for mobile devices for open street map? For mobile devices? <laughs> well, th the thing is that <laughs> there, you know, there are iPhones and there are Android-driven, uh, Android-based systems. Uh, this page works fine on iPhone, and there is no map for. Uh, sorry, there is no, there is no app for for uh, iOS. For Android, it's much better since even these apps are developed by community. So uh, when I watch this map, I basically on my cell phone go to OpenStreetMap. I don't have any app, but there are other apps which. One of them is called something like Map Me or Map With Me. That's an app which you take to your holiday and whenever you, you are, it asks you, so I know there is a street here, could you fill up the name? And I know there, there could be a barrier here, could you fill up whether it's there or not? It's interactive, it's asking you questions. My kids enjoy filling in it, filling it up. So that, that's how we mapped a part of, uh, of one place in Portugal, and you, you don't really program there. You really just answer, yes, the barrier is there, and this street has a lamps. And this app then translates it into these tags, what we see here, and sends it back to OpenStreetMap. So it's very, very easy to use uh, if you want to help with this mapping. But for just watching the maps, I'm using this page, OpenStreetMap.org. I believe that's what the last thing here is. It's not really a question, just a remark. The edit button is quite advanced. Android users can install the Street Complete app right, and, street and immediately complete. improve their surroundings. So I think this is the app you're, you're talking app, about. So whoever complete, contributed, yeah. it, thanks. Hey, well, thanks for your questions, and I'm, I'm sh closing it up now since there is time for next presentation. Thank you so much, Wojta. Thank you for your interaction. <laughs> thank you.
Mikrobit je programovateľný mini počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.